Well, praise the Lord, amen. Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for your word again. It's so rich and so good to us. Lord, we bless your name. We're learning ways to practice. It causes us to never meditate on guilt, condemnation, or unbelief again. And we thank you, Lord. Give us your spirit again this second hour. We need it even more so, Lord, this hour, because we've heard some things in the first hour that set us free from the enemy. And, Lord, we know this doesn't make them happy. But we ask you to keep him bound, keep him silenced as your word goes forth. We thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, praise God. We left off at 2 Corinthians 10 when the time sort of just flew bye-bye. Let's go back there and just pick up. And just remember this is session 11 and videotape number 11 on the Bible school. This is the second six weeks, second of the six-week period. And we're looking at ways of meditation on the Word of God that causes our minds and our hearts to be conformed and shaped and molded into the image and the character of Lord Jesus Christ, our part. God will do the work, but we have a part to play also. Amen? In fact, it says in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1, working together with Him. We're talking about our part in working together with Him. It's a marriage. It's a covenant. It's a relationship. Amen? Just like in a natural marriage, the husband has a role to play and the wife has a role to play. The wife is to help me. We're called the bride. And we have a role to perform as a help me. Is that right? So we're helping God. How are we helping God? By cooperation, by submitting ourselves to him. By placing ourselves in a place where God can do these things in us and with us. But we have a role to play. And our role is to meditate on the word of God continuously, day and night. Chew. Turn over in the mind over and over to meditate, to contemplate, to imagine. That's what daydreaming is, meditation. And we're looking at verse 5 and 6. We are destroying speculation. And every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive. Every thought, every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ, and we already, that means alert, sharp, aware. I think I got my generals mixed up. I think it was Alexander this guy told me about. Alexander the Great. What's your name, Alexander? To change your name. We are ready to punish all disobedience. I told you, punishing devils. When you begin to say, I'm standing on the word of God, the fire of God caused them to burn. Whether you burning under the fires of devils, is what torment is. He reverses the process. He says this happens when? Whenever. Whenever. Whenever your obedience is complete. When you're taking every thought captive, your obedience is complete. You're punishing demonic forces. You're punishing darkness. And then Paul gives him a warning in verse 7. He says, you're looking at things as if they are outwardly. <laughs> we don't look at things outwardly anymore, do we, folks? Now, let me show you something else about temptation. I had to put this in to remind ourselves of this. I know this church knows this for the most part. But I want to remind ourselves of this. Because we're all flesh, whether we're male or female. But there are times we're tempted to do evil. What's our, our attitude? Go to the book of Ecclesiastes, the 8th chapter. And look what God says to us about this being alert. See, when Paul says we are ready, that means we are sharp. We're expecting it. We're looking for it. We're anticipating the moves of the enemy. We're anticipating what happens to our minds in this dark realm. Ecclesiastes, the 8th chapter. And let's see what it says in the 11th verse. Ecclesiastes 8, and let's look at verse 11. This is what happened to David and Bathsheba. She was taking a bath on top of a roof one night as David, who should have been in the war, decided to stay home and not do any fighting. And so there he was as king, strolling on his, strolling on his roof. He looked, saw her, and what he saw produced in him an evil thought. And he meditated upon that evil thought. And he meditated upon that evil thought. He had lots of wives, lots of concubines, but when he saw her, you know how lust is, is never satisfied. An evil thought. And he meditated. 
upon this evil thought. He meditated so much that the first act he did toward rebelling against God, he went and sent someone to find out about her. And they came back with the report. She's married. Right then, he should have shut it off. Even then, he kept thinking about what he saw in that bathtub. He kept thinking about it. He kept thinking about it. And finally, he sent for her. And when the king sends for you, you must come. So she went. And we know the story. He fell. And judgment remained on his life, the rest of his life, while he was in the earth. Nathan told him that, didn't he? He said, violence will never depart from your house again because you've done this. What happened? Verse 11 is what didn't happen. Verse 11 is what should have happened. It didn't happen. And when things happen in our lives because we're not obeying verse 11, why did Paul say we are ready? Alert! Because this is what Paul's talking about. Verse 11 says, because the sentence against an evil deed, you might put thought, imagination, is not executed quickly. I told you before, the, the mind is the door of the heart. Look what it says happens to our hearts. Here is a transforming of our hearts and bringing our heart in agreement with Satan. Meditating on the word of God brings our heart in agreement with God. Here it's when the heart is brought into agreement with Satan. He says, if that sentence, that means God's judgment, is not executed quickly, he says, therefore, let me tell you the sum of it, he's saying, the hearts of the son of men among them are given fully to do evil. Because David didn't execute it quickly, his heart said, you can go ahead and do it, God will forgive you later. He did it. And the cost was horrible. Amen? Look, it says in Psalms 119, verse 36. Here's why there's no condemnation of those in Christ Jesus. We're working together with him, doing the things that please him. The one that he said, may my meditation be pleasing to him. I guarantee when you meditate on God's word, folks, it's pleasing to him. Did you know that? Amen. Psalms 119. And let's look at verse 36 through verse 38. by his spirit and David is praying this to the Lord it's a prayer suppose you don't have no taste for the word of God I mean it's just boring to you you try to read and it's Dullsville you know you get caught up in this one begot that one and that one begot this one and this one begot that one you say oh why all these begots in there folks even the begots are important it proves that Jesus fulfilled perfectly the scriptures that was prophesied concerning him and so here's a prayer you can pray. We talked about this Psalms before and all the prayers that are in it. This is a request from God and the request is a prayer. Then ask the Lord to do this to your heart. It's a request for God to do something in the heart so that we can cooperate with God in bringing about our heart being aligned with his will. Incline, that means bend. That means take my heart in your hand and squeeze it and just bend it and force it. Incline my heart to thy testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity. That means all the lust of this world. The Lord told us through John. Jesus said through him, Love not the world or the things in the world, for all that's in the world is lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life. David, I mean, excuse me, Solomon writes continually in the Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes, it is all vanity. Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity. And revive me. That means you must have died. You can be revived. Revive me in thy ways. Establish thy word to thy service as that which produces reverence for thee. Are those words also in your Bible? Amen. It's a prayer. You can pray it. You can say, Lord, I'm praying for you to do something in my heart. Cause my heart to be forced to your word. I'll tell you a prayer I prayed when the Lord set me free from television. I said, make everything on here look dull to me. But he gave me no satisfaction, no joy, no comfort. You know, he did that. 
People say, well, I threw my TV set out. Well, I guarantee you, if God can do the work in your heart, when you go visit your sister, your brother in the Lord, he got a TV set in their house and it's on, you find your eyes, yes, sister, y'all, we love the Lord. You find your eyes looking right there with them. Why? Because God didn't do the work, you try to do it. <laughs> God must do anything, must he? How about Jeremiah? It says in Jeremiah, the second chapter. I'm telling you, God must do everything. With God's workmanship. Jeremiah 2. And this is what the Lord says to us in verse 19. Jeremiah 2, verse 19. And we're talking about when there's no fear of God in our life, what we'll do. And we saw that meditation and asking God to do the work in our heart produces the fear of God. Is that right? Jeremiah says in the second chapter, he says, your own wickedness will do what to you? Correct, Correct you. And your apostasies. Now, let me tell you why I wanted to look this up. Because we, we, we had a prayer a while ago that said, do what to the heart? Incline. Is that right? The, see, we have read over here in Hosea, and we'll look at that about people's hearts always turning to evil. Well, the heart turning to evil is the word apostasy. Apostasy means a tendency for your heart to bend and to always lead you in the back which is evil. Let me ask you a question. We can be honest. We all walk this way for a while. Have you ever found yourself continuing in the same place with the same temptation, always giving into the same temptation, and even when you're given into the temptation, you know why you're involved in it, it is evil. Ever had that happen to you? Amen. Yeah. Something is in the heart. The heart is still stationary, bent to evil. So you say, Lord, bend my heart to your t- commandments. Bend my feet to your testimonies. Turn my eyes looking at vanity. It's a request. It says, and your apostasies will reprove you. It means as long as your heart is bent to evil, guess what? You are the law. The law comes on you. Know therefore and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God. As long as your heart is bent to evil, you will always forsake God, even knowing better. God goes on to say, he says, and the dread of me is not in you, declares Lord God. Well, I just got to reading to you Psalms 119, a prayer that we can all pray and ask God to do something in our hearts that will always bend us to the place where the fear of God will be maintained in our lives. And where there's a fear of God, folks, there's always a turning away from evil. Are you listening to me? Amen. Let's go to Jeremiah 5, 8th place, Jeremiah the 8th chapter. Jeremiah chapter 8. Look what it says in the 5th and 6th verse. Jeremiah 8, verse 5. Why then has his people Jerusalem turned away in continual, what's that word right there? Apostasy. It means our heart is always bending the other way, always leading them. See, the Bible says, was it Ecclesiastes 10? Um, I can't think of the verse number. I think it's three, but I'm, I'm not sure if it's three. It says, a wise man's heart will always direct him toward the right. In Matthew 26 or 25, I think it is, it said when Jesus comes back, he will separate the sheep from the goats and put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. A wise man's heart, Ecclesiastes 10 says, will always direct him to the right. And a foolish man's heart, there's your wise and foolish virgins, will always direct him to the left. That's why he said, Lord, bend my heart to righteousness. When that happens, this will be a part of your life. You won't live in place of condemnation. 
Jeremiah says, why did has his people Jerusalem turned away in continual apostasy? That means bending to evil. They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. As long as God has not bent your heart to his testimonies, as long as God has not bent your heart to his commandments, you cannot return. That's what it means. They refuse to return. You cannot return. You can long to return. You can desire to return. But if your heart is still bent to that evil, you can't return. The heart is the one that steers you. And the heart is not a blood pump. The heart is the real you. Amen? And what we really are is a heart. One more place. In Jeremiah, the fifth chapter. Notice again what it says. In the fifth chapter. And the sixth verse. About being in a place where the demon powers have total reign to do to you whatever they please while you speak in tongues and prophesy and say that you're under the blood and the demons can't come into the blood. You ready? Now this is God's people is talking about. In fact, the fifth chapter begins by saying wrong to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. This is talking about God's people. That's the place for God's people. Amen? So we read the fifth um, well, tell you what let's do. Let's go to verse 5 because he talks about the leaders. And I want you to notice what he talks about. Did Jesus say, Come unto me, all you that are weak and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest? Then he said to do something else, he would do it. He said to do what? Take my oh, yoke upon you. That means a place where you're under God's control. You know, when I used to have my iguanas, I would leave them walking with me down the street. I gave them to uh, Pastor Sonny's little girl. And that yoke would leave that iguana. He couldn't get away from it. Yoke around the neck. I want you to notice this. I will go to the great and will speak to them. That's leadership. For they know the way of the Lord. Does verse 5 say they know the way of the Lord? Mm -hmm. Now, is it there? If you know the way of the Lord, that means you must have been taught the way of the Lord. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And the ordinance of their God, that means they know his commandments. But I want you to understand what it says. But they too, with one accord, have broken the yoke and burst the bonds. And here's when the demon power was eat up God's people. Therefore, a lion from the forest will slay them. A wolf of the desert shall destroy them. A leper is watching their cities. And what is cities always a type of? Church. Church. Everyone who goes out of them will be torn in what? Pieces. Because their transgressions are many. There, there's that word again, apostasy. That means the bending of the heart toward evil are numerous. Are those words also in your Bible? Amen. That's why we pray that prayer. Lord, bend my heart from evil. In Hosea 11 chapter. See, we don't have to walk in condemnation about, listen to me. I'm showing you this because... Remember the theme of the 8th chapter of Romans. There's no condemnation for those that's in Christ Jesus. Suppose you got a bondage in your life that you can't seem to break. You don't want to walk in condemnation about it. Pray Psalm 119. Lord, bid my heart to your testimonies. Bid my heart to your commandments. You have to walk in condemnation and give it I just can't break it. I'm going to come back to it. But every time I do, I mean, you know, I'm going to fall again. That, that's nonsense. In Hosea 11 chapter, Notice what it says in the seventh verse, Hosea 11, verse 7. Eleven seven. <laughs> Lord here and he says, let's begin at verse 6. The sword will, well, let's begin at verse um, 5. They will not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria, that means a place of sheeping shepherds, he will be their king because they refuse to return to me. And the sword, that's God's judgment, will whirl against their cities, that means churches, and will demolish their gate bars. I mean, there won't be no places of God's authority in that church. 
and consume them because they're counseled. Counsels means religious beliefs. So, so that you won't be confused about this, what's those next two words, please? My Everybody tell me. It says what? My people. So again, we're not talking about sinners of the world. My people are bent. Now the word bent means a tendency to sin easily. There's a defect in the heart that causes you to sin almost with no effort. A tendency to sin easily. My people are bent, he said. That means the heart has been bent on turning from me. Do they call them to the one on high? None at all exalts him. It means by the lifestyle they live. Are oh, you listening to me? In Hosea the 14th chapter, the Lord tells us how to return. Now I read to you a while ago a Psalms 119 to be exact telling us the prayer we should pray or asking God to bring us back to him verses 36 through 38 do we not need to read that? now I'm going to say this to you when we read the 14th chapter whenever you go to God about anything folks always pray to him his word not yours God is not impressed with my words he's not impressed with your words he said put me in remembrance is that right? he said you do remind the Lord take no rest for yourselves day or night is that right? And you remind him, he says, until he establishes his righteousness in Jerusalem until it's burning like a torch. But we're Jerusalem, Hebrews 5 says, when you come to Christ, you come to the heaven of Jerusalem, Mount Zion. Is that right? Well, here's how you pray. Same thing you read about Joel's army. He told us what to pray. God tells us how to pray. This Bible is a prayer book. If you don't know it, you need to go buy one. The Lord says in the 14th chapter, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. For you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you, that's the word of God, and return to the Lord. He'll even tell you how to pray. Say to him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously that we may present the fruit of our lips. He says that verse 3 should be your attitude. He told us to pray, is that right? Assyria will not save us. We will not ride on horses. Horses means the power of the flesh. Now, if you don't know about the horse, he's, he's an example, which means flesh, but he's also known for his fearlessness of just charging into battle. Knives and swords don't scare him. That's why there are people who have their hearts bent on evil. They can't help themselves. They know that God's judgment and wrath will come on them. They can sit under this kind of message and still sin because their heart is still bent to evil. That's why you pray this prayer, because God said to pray it. We will not ride on horses, nor will we will again say, Our God, to the work of our hands, well, we're going to do it. For in thee the orphan, that means a lost person, finds mercy. Are those words in your Bible? Let that be your attitude. In other words, you make up your mind. I'm not going to run to a place of compromise. I'm not going to run to just any preacher because he got, a, he got the name Reverend behind his name, or pastor, or evangelist, or, or prophet, or whatever behind his name. I'm not going to call my religious works why God should receive me. I'm not going to call that my God. He said, I'm going to remember something. In the Lord, the lost, the orphan, the one that has no father, he finds mercy in God. And here's what God says he'll do. God says, I'll heal their apostasies. I'll do a work of deliverance in that heart where there's that place in them it shall cause them to sin very easily against me. God says, I will love them freely. Apostasy means a tendency to sin easily. It's called being bent. We just read that a while ago in Hosea 11 chapter, the seventh verse, didn't we? So in other words, apostasy is a leaning of the heart towards sin. And so how do you know when your heart has that in it? Anybody know how? How can you know when that's in your heart? A good answer? No. He came the closest. When there's still something in you that desires it. How do you know God has granted you repentance in that area? When the desire is not there anymore. And the Bible says in Timothy, God has to grant us repentance. Repentance is not saying, God, I'm sorry. Repentance is a work of grace that comes only from the Holy Spirit that is imparted to us from the Lord. One good prayer to pray, I've learned to say, Lord, grant me repentance in this area. 
I wasn't calling it repentance when I was so hooked on television. I was just telling God I didn't want it to continue to pull at me. So I started out by saying, take away from me um, all the violence. And then I started seeing violent movies. I hated them. I mean, detested them. Didn't realize he was doing it. And so then I got to the comedies. And now the comedies are not even funny. I keep wondering if that's just really some stage laughter they got because I can't see how anybody can laugh at that junk that's on the day for comedy. So I can't tell the difference if it was because God's not working in my heart. Where after the comedy, they left hardly anything else but the for sports. So because I was so hooked on sports, I mean, I don't even like ice hockey. If they had ice hockey, it was a sport, I'd watch it. So finally I said, Lord, take sports out of my life. And now, um, you know he did to me? I was watching a basketball game. I can almost tell you what this happened. And this guy was running on the floor, putting this ball in the basket. And I heard the Spirit of God say, how many times have you seen that same play over and over and over again? And why are you still watching it? You know what they're going to do. He said, now when he gets through, then another guy's going to take off and he's going to run down the other end and he's going to put the ball in the basket too. He said, what are you looking for in it? He said, I don't know. And then I watched some more and it got duller and duller and duller. And then he began to remind me that in God, he can never, never be probed. And that everything that he continues to reveal to us is always something new and something exciting. And why wasn't I spending my time doing that? So I told him, see, I learned. I said, Lord, put it in me. And now sports is done. It's wonderful. So I got that box of torment in my house. I turn it on and just nothing on it, just blah. I've had times when the Lord said, come pray. And I said, let me turn this on TV first. I turn it on, I find myself just clicking. And I said, ain't there some more stations somewhere? It's not. He goes, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll pray. I'll read the word. I'll pray in tongues. I'll put my parrot on my shoulder. We're going to walk on the street just praying in tongues together. You know, one of my birds trying to imitate me. I don't know what he thinks I'm saying. But you're almost way you're speaking in tongues. He makes his wild sound. It's crazy, you know. Well, here's what God says he will do. He says, I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew. That means blessing to Israel. He will blossom like the lily. Folks, who's the lily? Ah. In other words, I'll make you reflect his character, his nature, his beauty, and his loveliness. And he will take root like the seeds of Lebanon. That means like a tree. What about that tree is planted? Think it might be by the waters. And his shoots will sprout. His beauty will be like the olive tree. His fragrance like the seeds of Lebanon. I mean, you'll, you'll smell strong in the Lord. And those who live in his shadow will again raise grain. They will blossom like a vine. His renown will be like the wine of Lebanon. I could use some of that. How about you? <laughs> now, how do we do it? How can it be done? Can I tell you? Very good. May I one other thing? Go to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Folks, I'm telling you that we cannot do it ourselves. Did you know that? I wonder if I should camp here while I prove you this is all of the Bible. Let's take the first verse. Since therefore we have so good a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance, circle encumbrances with places, 
but still cause us to sin. Lay it aside, he said. I want to put that place of temptation. Places where you still have desires. God says, lay it aside. Is that in your Bible? In fact, he said, also lay aside. And this is after Hebrews 11, when he talked about those that died, all died in faith pleasing God. He said, you also do what they did, lay it aside. How do you lay it aside? He said, lay aside the sin which so easily, easily entangles us. How? Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Uh, most of us have no much about this endurance stuff. You know, we keep hearing people saying, I feel like quitting, I feel like giving up. No endurance of men. How do you do it? He tells us in verse 2 how to do it. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. That's how you do it. You fix your eyes on Jesus. Why do you fix your eyes on Jesus? For him to give you the grace to do it. You're not fixing your eyes on Jesus to look at him. It was you going to him saying, Lord, help me in this. Lord, deliver me in this. Lord, set me free in this. You follow what I'm saying to you? Amen. And you can go all through this and you'll see why there's no place of condemnation because you're not taking your sin saying, oh, I'm having fun with my sin. Lord, you're saying, Lord, I'm crying out to you. Deliver me from my sin. That's why there's no condemnation. You're running to Jesus. That's what First Peter tells us continuously. 2 verse 1 and then verses 4 and 5. It tells us also the same thing that Brother Paul just told us in Hebrews 12. Amen? Amen. Hebrews, in fact, Ephesians 2 verses 8 through 10 says, By grace we are saved, and it has nothing to do with ourselves. And then it says, We are his workmanship. Oh my. And what's our part? Meditation? But running to Jesus. Is that right? That's why there's no condemnation. What? How in the world can anybody walk in condemnation? Oh, yeah, we are doing these things and know these things to do. Could the answer possibly be we're not doing them? That we're not taking every thought captive? That we're not meditating on the word of God day and night? And that we're not running to Jesus? That we're not looking at Jesus? I told you before, wherever there's a side of God, there's also another side. When you're not running to Jesus by what you're not meditating on the word of God, not taking any thought captive, then you're running to the devil. And you got your eyes on the devil. Does that make sense? Let me show you first Peter. I just love first Peter. Two. Verse 1, therefore, putting aside all, there's the word all, malice, all, there's all again, God, hypocrisy, envy, and how much slander? Wow. All slander. How? Verse 4, coming, continuous, present as action, never stopping, coming to him, as to a living stone, rejected by men, put there, rejected by men of flesh. The choice in precious in the sight of God. That means when you start running to Jesus, folks, you are doing something that is choice and is precious to God to see you do that. It gives God delight by seeing you continually run to Jesus. And then when you start doing that, something happens. He tells you in verse 5 what happens. You also as living stones are being, I-N-G, built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Are those words in your Bible? That's how you do it. Folks, I could have given you Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, Revelation 21, 5. 
Revelation 21 5, Jesus is on the throne and he says, Behold, I am making all things new. It's a process. He's making all things new in us. He's out there playing with a yo yo, saying, One of these days I'm going to reign and rule. My Bible tells me through Daniel, my Bible tells me through the prophet Zechariah that when Jesus ascended up in the glory, his reign and his rule begin then. We've got all these people waiting for his reign and rule to begin. Folks, he's about to come back. While they're waiting for his reign and rule to begin, he's reigning and ruling now. Psalms 110 says the very same thing. Do I need to share some of those scriptures in back? We know that, don't we? Amen? Amen? Is that right? Now, the Lord says to us in Psalms 127.1, what kind of house can you build for me? Don't you understand that scripture? Did you ever catch that scripture? These things I'm just bringing you remember, so I'm not really assigning these that you might not want to. Have you considered that scripture? That was Lord saying to say to us, what in the world can you do to please me? That's what it means. See, the house is us. Is that right? So God is saying, what can you build for me? Nothing. He has to build it in us. He's the architect. Can't change ourselves. We're totally helpless. Amen? Well, let's go into Psalm 63. You might want to also include in your notes, if you're taking notes, Isaiah 66, 1 and 2 will tell you something quite similar. But in Psalm 63, let's look at verse 6. Psalm 63, verse 6. Let me begin to speak this up. We have taken so many rabbit trails this morning. It's Here David writes, he says, When I remember thee on my bed, I meditate on thee in the night watches. Now folks, let me ask you this question. We've learned pretty much in this church about times when God wakes in the middle of the night and usually I preach to pray and it didn't lie to you. But you learned something else new to today too. So many times we say, well, I don't know why I'm so wide awake. I think I want another piece of lemon pie I had for supper. Yeah, it should be a piece in the refrigerator. And so we get up in the box and get that lemon pie and eat and go back to bed. Where well, you miss God's call for prayer. Something else you can do. You can meditate. Start meditating on the word. Let the word just run through your mind. That's what David's saying here. The night watches. That means the time when you wake up all hours of the night. He said, for thou hast been my help in the shadow of thy wings. I will sing for joy. My soul clings to thee. Oh, soul clings to him. David, how are you able to keep your soul clinging to God? He just told you. I'm meditating in the night watches. I remember God while even when I'm in my bed. Now the bed is a symbol for the place where we're the most relaxed. When you're the most relaxed and most happy, do you stop and meditate on God? Thy right hand upholds me. Amen? In Psalm 77, let's look at it there. See, folks, I want to make sure today that we don't have to come this through this condemnation thing again. That we have spent two of the sessions, last the last of last week's session, the first part of this week's session, and I'm into this part. The second, the first part of uh, the second session of this week, dealing with just one area, the condemnation, the guilt part. There should never be another person that ever walk in condemnation of guilt ever again, unless you have made up your mind that you want to play with your sins and your lusts for a while and not come to God. We don't have, we won't have any excuse anymore. Amen. In Psalm 77, let's look at verse 6, because see, when this tape goes click, 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 I don't care where I am in Scripture giving you, I'm going to stop the condemnation part, and then we're going to get into what it talks about this hostile mind. Okay? So let's look what it says. Psalm 77, look what it says in verse 6. It says, I will remember my song in the night. I will meditate with my what? 
heart. Did I not tell you that when your mind starts meditating, it brings the heart in? And my spirit ponders. Folks, do you know what that word means? My spirit is pondering? It means it causes your spirit, the real you, begin to search the deep things, the hidden mysteries of God himself. It begins by meditating on the word. The spirit gets involved, the heart gets involved, and then the search begins. You search from it with all your heart and say, you'll find it. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Look at verse 11 and 12. I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will what? Meditate on all thy work. Begin with the cross. There's his word. And muse on all thy deeds. Are those words also in your Bible? In Psalms 119, let's go back there quickly because it's all through 119. Let's spend some time with this 119 Psalms. I can get all this in by taking shortcuts. In Psalms 119, we begin to read what the Lord says to us in verse 15. He said, there's a sound. A sound. Well, let me go to 119. You ready? The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. Is that in your Bible? The shouting is about God becoming our salvation. Oh, excuse me, I'm in 118, forgive me. 119, excuse me. But that was good too, though, you know it? I will meditate, he says, on all thy precepts, verse 15, and regard thy ways. That means I will only think about God and think about God's ways. I shall delight in thy statutes, and I will not forget thy words. Are those words in your Bible? Here's the key is meditation. In verse 27, look what he says. Make me understand the way of thy precepts. How? So I will meditate on all thy wonders. Is that the mind going right back to God again? It's a prayer, by the way. Did you catch the prayer? Make me, make me understand. That's a prayer to pray. In verse 48, he says, I shall lift up my hands to thy commandments which I love, and I will do what? I will meditate on all thy statutes. In verse 78, he says, May the arrogant be ashamed, for they subvert me with a lie. But I shall meditate on thy precepts. This man has found the secret, hasn't he? Look what it says in Psalms 100, excuse me, the same 119 Psalms, verse 148. I cry to thee, save me, and I shall keep thy testimonies. Excuse me, I'm in verse 146. My eyes anticipate the night watches. Have you ever come to a place where you said, Lord, I can hardly wait till nighttime gets here just so I can spend time in the bed meditating on your word? Have you come to that place yet? Or do you say, Lord, I can hardly wait for the nighttime to get here because this is, you know, Monday night, Lord, and NFL football's on. Usually when, that, when that's our attitude, we don't call the Lord at all, do we? We just have to say, boy, I can hardly wait till the night's here. Boy, I assume you watch TV. God's going to win the picture. This man says, I'm in for the night because I can meditate on, on my bed, on, on God's word. In verse 23, look what he says. Let's go back there. He says, even though princes sit and talk against me, thy servant meditates on thy statue. Oh, did you catch it? Did you see anything there? What stood out to you? Anything at all? Servant. Who's the servant of God? He's meditating on God's statues. Yeah. That's the servant of the Lord. The one that's not doing that is another side. He's the servant of his flesh. Now do you catch it? Have to give you one more. You want one more? Mm-hmm. Let's see, I might have a little more time there. Well, I'll do this, but it's going to go twin. Look what it says in 143, verse 5. Psalms 143, verse 5. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy doings, not what Satan's doing. You mention what God's doing and has done. I muse on the work of thy hands. I stretch up my hands to thee. My soul longs for thee as a parched land. 
When you start meditating on God, folks, he creates a thirst to this in you. And when the thirst this is created in you, then Jesus can fulfill his word. He said, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be fulfilled. Is that right? How do you get thirsty? When you start meditating on God, when you start meditating on his word, the spirit of God creates in you that longing for him. And you find yourself in a place that, Lord, I'm thirsty for you just like I was in a desert place for water. It begins by meditation. A wonder Paul wrote 2 Corinthians 10, huh? In Psalms 145, look what it says in the fifth verse. Psalms 145, verse 5. Here David says, Oh, the glorious splendor of thy majesty. And on thy wonderful works, I will do what? Meditate. Meditate. In Psalms 119, well, it's about, well, it's about ready to go click, but since I got there, you might want to include verses 97 and 99. Well, we're about to get into the mind. About that man that loves to think about death. But in Psalms 119, since you're there, I'll just give you these two and I'll stop. I'll cut it off there. I won't go beyond these two. Now this begins with verse 97, and over verse 97 is the word M-E-M, mem, it means the love of God's law. That's what the Hebrew means there, the love of God's law. And here's where this man's come to this place where his heart is being really molded, almost molded. It's almost there now. He says, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thy commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. Did you catch that? I have more insight than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. You catch that, folks? Now, let's begin to move on from there. Now, I need to add one thing. Sum this up. When you begin to really meditate on God's word and his commandments, it causes a faith to be produced. That's why it says faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. It doesn't mean sitting in a, a school setting like this and just hearing somebody expound the word of God. It, it can mean that also. But I find it in a much richer sense, in a deeper sense, when you align your mind to let the word of God revolve continuously in the mind, and you listen to the word of God maybe on tapes, you start mind start wondering about other, all of a sudden other scriptures begin to spring to life like popcorn all through you. All of a sudden you start having faith. And then your faith causes your life to fulfill Revelation 12, 11. And that faith caused you to overcome anything. And the Bible says they overcome. They overcame because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimonies. The word of your testimony is the word of God, not your thoughts. That's the word of your testimony. This word becomes your testimony. This word becomes your life. Is that clear? Amen. Through faith in his promises and his blood, you overcome. Now, Philippians 4, Paul says something there to us. And I want you to see what he says to us. Philippians 4, because we're about to see about this carnal mind, this hostile mind, this reprobate mind, this backsliding mind that God calls his enemy. Philippians 4, this is what Paul says. The seventh verse, he says, the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then he says, Finally, brother, whatever thing, whatever is true, the work of the cross is true, folks. Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, folks, that's all the word of God. Whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and any, anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell. That means meditate on these things. Is it also in your Bible? 
Now Paul meditated so much what the word says, that was why he could state verse 12. He said, I know how to go along with humble means. That means have nothing. I also know how to live in prosperity, which means it doesn't go to my head. In any and every circumstance, can you imagine making that statement? In any and every circumstance, in any and every circumstance, he says, I've learned a secret. Now, folks, secret means something that is not revealed to everyone. Secrets mean that which is shared with the most intimate of friends. I've learned the secret. Learn means it was taught. It means it was something he wants them to have knowledge of. Is that right? I have learned the secret of going hungry, of being filled, both of having abundance and suffering need. Doesn't matter what he's going through. So I can do all things through him. That means I can walk through anything who strengthens me. Amen. And how did it begin? Through meditating on the Word of God. And this mind to learn those things. Amen? Amen? Now, there is something about the mind you need to know. The mind will always go toward evil if it's left unchecked. Would you go to Romans 7? Verse 23 and verse 24. Romans 7. Verse 23 and verse 24. Paul says, I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my what? Mind. Does your Bible say waging war? Was that word, was that term used? Waging war. Waging war. Folks, let me tell you about Satan. He never stops. I'm telling you, the war is on right now. Now, our minds right now is being bent toward the word of God. And for the most part, we're not even noticing the war. Can you say amen to that? There's more of a peace with us. But what happens when you leave here? You go out into a world. That's where the war is. That's where the wilderness is. That's where the desert place is. That's the place of no water there. That's the cursed place. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one, he says. And when you're driving home, you're not driving home with your eyes closed. You'll see everything on the way home. And everything you see with your eyes causes a reaction in the thought land. Is that right? Amen. So what do you do? You meditate on, you meditate on the word of God. You keep it going. You keep it around. Amen? Amen? I see a different law in the members of my body. He said there is a law here that means that means control in his members, body parts. There are some things you and I you'll find yourself still doing when God is delivering you out of just habits, where your members have been trained in the habits of sin. Are you hearing me? God would have delivered you from sin, and then you'll find yourself still reacting sometimes as if you're still in that habit of sin, law in the members. Your eyes are member, your tongues are member, your feet are member, your hands are member. He says, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to sin. He says, of the law of sin, where is it located? Which is in my members. Is that in your Bible? That's why the mind can't be left unchecked. And that's why he said, verse 24, O wretched man that I am. He knew he didn't want to stay in that predicament. Amen? Look what it says in the 8th chapter. And look at verse, let's begin at verse 5. Now, we have gone through Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. And all the other scriptures I've given you were Romans 8, 1 through 4 in different ways of the Holy Spirit. Then we come to a whole new thought. Now Romans 8, 4 said, 
But this is for those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That's at the very end of your verse, in the fourth verse, if you have the American Standard Bible. Now, he begins to tell us something. He says, for those who are according to the flesh, does your Bible say according to the flesh? That means they're walking in the will of their flesh. According to the flesh means you're walking the will of the flesh, walking in the will of the flesh, walking in the desires of the flesh, he said they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, that means they walk in a, by the leading of the Spirit, in the ways of the Spirit, in the, in the dictates of the Spirit, they're setting their minds on the things of the Spirit. Why are they setting their minds on things of the Spirit? Because that's what they're after. That's what they desire. And now he tells us something. For the mind set on the flesh is what? Yeah. Death. That means spiritual death. That's why David said many times, revive me, Lord. Restore me, Lord. But the mind that is set on the spirit is what? Life and peace. Now folks, we're still under the heading while there's no condemnation of those in Christ Jesus. So you might say this, this is just so elementary, kindergartenish, I hate to even say it, but he says, speak as a little child, and we could become little children. You might put it this way. Now you've had this battle of condemnation. Now let me tell you what you was going through. When your mind was set in the flesh, that was death, and that's where condemnation came in. When your mind was in the spirit, that's life and peace, and there is no condemnation. You understand that now? He says, because the mind set on the flesh is what? Hostile toward God. Oh my. Does your Bible say the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God? For it does not subject itself to the law of God. And God's law is, you should love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. Is that right? And very, remember last week we saw that that was a righteous requirement of the law. The law is constantly saying, destroy, destroy, and mercy. And God says, that mind, for it is not even able to do so. He says in verse 8, those who are in the flesh, that means in the power of their flesh, cannot, cannot please God. Is that also in your Bible? Now, let's look at some scriptures that we reflect we just read. Because the mindset of the flesh is hostile toward God. Then it says, it's not even able to do so. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Is that in your Bible? Amen. Let's go first of all to the book of Peter. And let's look at what he says to us in the second chapter and the 11th verse because we've already seen Paul tell us about this war waging in his mind. Is that right? First Peter 2, verse 11. Now Peter writes almost the same revelation. And he says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers. In other words, I am pushing you, oppressing you, or doing all I can to assist you to remember that we are to be foreigners while we're in the earth. And we're to live our lives as if we don't belong here and never belong here. That's what it means by being an alien and a stranger. I urge you urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from what's those next two words? Fleshly lusts or cravings or desires which wage war against the what? Soul. It's death. It, it, it wages to kill the soul. How do you know when your soul is killed? When you have no desire for God. When you care less about the things of God. Amen? In 2 Corinthians 7, here Paul writes, and he says, Therefore, having these promises, and he uses the term, same term, beloved, let us 
cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. Why? Because the flesh is waging war against the soul. Is that right? And then Paul says to us here, here is how we perfect holiness in the fear of God. Now, let me say it again before we go any further. We cannot do it in our own strength. We have to keep coming to Jesus to get it done. Is that right? In Galatians 5, 16. Now, I always remind myself when I read this, first of all, if, how many of these things are still in my life? And how many things I see in the life of the so-called Christians around me? I have to keep reminding myself that people with this in their life don't get them to heaven. Is that right? The Lord says in the 16th verse, But I say walk by the Spirit, and you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. How do you walk by the Spirit? By meditation. That's how you walk by the Spirit. He says, For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. That's why when you hear the Lord say to you, Come pray. And your flesh says, I don't feel like it. The war's going on. And the spirit, he's also having a war against the flesh. And these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you place. But if you're led by the spirit, and we've learned, and we'll see it again, that to be led by the spirit means to do what? Put to death all the deeds and desires of the flesh. Is that right? If you're led by the Spirit, he told us something. You are not under the law. You're not in that place of none no, of no, no God's mercy. I mean, of course, he mentions that the deeds of the flesh are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, and carousing. Things like these, of which I foretold you, just like forewarn you, that those who practice such things shall not what? Inherit. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Is that right? Amen. Shall not inherit. Shall not. That means you lost your heritage. You got, got cut out of God's will. Ever heard of people getting cut out of the will? Verse 24. And those who belong to Christ... Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Amen? In Galatians 6, look at the 8th verse. For the one who sows to his own flesh, how do you sow to the flesh? Being fleshly minded. Shall from the flesh reap what? Corruption. Remember, put corruption, put maggots. But the one who sows to his spirit, how do you sow to the spirit? Being spiritually minded. That's right. Shall from the spirit reap what? Eternal life. Amen? In Jude 1, look what he says in verse 7 and 8. Well, Jude only had one chapter. But I always say Jude 1. Now, we'll find a word here called dreaming. It means meditation. Just as thought of Ingomara and the scissors around them, since they are in the same way as these, indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh or exhibited as an example, that means the example is, we know about what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, that was an example. Paul says in Romans 15, 4, these things are written for your example. In undergoing the punishment of eternal fire, yet in the same manner, these men also by dreaming, with their minds set on fleshly things, it causes your flesh to become defiled. And when your flesh is defiled, you despise and reject authority, and you will even revile angelic majesties. You will even obey the power of God if he shows up. You understand that? By what your mind reflects to. The mind. Dreaming. This is me was having a nightmare, folks. This is a person's wide awake having desires and imaginations of doing it. Amen? In Romans 7, let's go back there. The book of Romans, the seventh chapter. The 
the the Lord says in the fifth verse. For while we were in the flesh, that means all you live for, comfort and satisfaction of your flesh. The sinful passions which were aroused by the law, knowing that it's wrong, and then there's something in the flesh that gives you more pleasure than obeying that which you know that God would have us to do. We're at work in the members of our bodies to bear fruit for what? Death. He just told you to be carnal minded is death. Is that right? Talk to me. Is that right? Amen. Let's go back to the 8th chapter. Look what he says in verses 9 through 11. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Let me ask you a question. Does the spirit of God dwell in you? Amen. Then guess what? You're in a spiritual plane. You're in a heavenly place. Even though sometimes your mind might jump on the flesh. Sin shall not be master over you. Reckon yourselves dead. Is that right? Amen. The old man was crucified with Christ. Say with me. I'm in the spirit. I'm in the spirit. And when I find myself daydreaming on the flesh, when I find myself daydreaming on the flesh, it's a lie. I'm looking at. Did you catch that? Let me say it again this way. Every temptation of evil that comes against us is a lie that we have already been set free from. I don't care how much your body's craving, what the demons are telling you, with your mouth say, this is a lie. I've been set free from this. How do I know? Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage, he said, of the service of the Lord, and the vindication or acquittal is for me. It's your job to say with your mouth, this is a lie. I don't really want this. This is a fiery trial. I've been set free. I have in the word. There's Romans 6. This sin shall be master over me any longer. My old man was crucified with him. Amen? So we can now move on to but he says in the time first. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, that's a lost person. He doesn't belong to it. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, now, let me explain something to you. Did you know we're going to be given new bodies? Is that okay? These fleshly bodies is dead. To God's righteousness, to God's holiness, and to the desires for God. Now, he's not talking about dead, dead, like we think about dead, you know, dead, you've been embalmed. He's telling us, even though we have the Spirit of God within us, that this flesh still is alive. For the things of hell. Does that make better sense to you? Mm-hmm. Have you have you ever gotten so high in the spirit? Maybe you haven't, but have you ever just had an experience where you got just rid of the Lord, just you and the Lord, and just so wonderful, and you were in a place you said, "Oh, praise God! Well, I, I, I'll never leave you again. I'm gonna do this every day." You ever had that experience? But you went to bed that night and woke up the next day, and the next day came, and what happened? Your flesh is still dead. If your flesh is alive, the way God's talking about, did you know you will always stay in that state of euphoria at all times? When he said the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit and these are in opposition, when you wake up in the morning, your flesh is screaming alive for that which is darkness. And so we have to do some work to stay above this flesh, don't we, folks? But that comes a time, folks, when our bodies are joined back again 
as heavenly bodies with that spirit man and the soul of man. God can put us in any realm whatsoever. And I don't care how much evil is going on. I don't care how much he gives the light to the flesh, like we know the flesh. Guess what? That I have no power over us. Now do you know why Jesus will walk through the earth and resist every temptation and not ever give in to sin? In him dwell the fullness of the Godhead bodily, folks. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh, the Bible says. Is that right? That's why he still has his body. His body never sinned in the earth. Amen? Now, let's continue. He says, but, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. So, do you understand something here, folks? That while we walk in this earth, we're walking almost as a complex personality? But I can tell you something. If you can learn to practice staying in the word of God daily, folks, and staying before the Lord every day, you'll rule your flesh. Amen. Your flesh won't rule you. And you have to come to a place where you say, Lord, I know what the price is. I'm going to stir myself up daily to take hold of you. Now, it says your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Is that right? It means work of justification is what it means. Work of justification. He's already done it. Amen? But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, is Jesus dwelling in you? Amen. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. That means a continuous issuing of life to overcome that flesh, folks. Now, that was some debate one time about, well, I think maybe if I'm so bound in sin, then the Spirit of God's not dwelling with me. I will remind you to who this letter was written. Go back to Romans 1. He says in verse 6, 5, through whom we have received grace. Folks, have we all received grace? Mm -hmm. And apostleship. Have we all received apostleship? Mm -hmm. To bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the what? Oh. Called of Jesus Christ. So is God's spirit dwelling in us? Amen. Amen. Now, In verse 9, he says, if you are born again of the Spirit, let's go back to verse 9. He says, you're not of the flesh, but you're in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if you're born of the Spirit, it means you've been made free from the law. Did you know that? If you're born again of the Spirit of God, you have been made, not going to be made, you have been made free from the law. Is that right? Mm -hmm. what, what, go to Romans 7. Let me show it to you that way then. Romans 7, look what it says in verse 4 and 5. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. Are you in the body of Christ? Amen. That you might be joined to another. Are you joined to another? Amen. To him who was raised from the dead. Are you joined to him that was raised from the dead? Amen. That we might bear fruit from, for who? God, for while we were in the flesh, he said, well, we're not in the flesh anymore. If God says while we were in the flesh, that means we are not in the flesh anymore. Say with me. I may be walking in the flesh, but I'm not in the flesh. I am in the spirit. You catching on? Begin to think that way. <laughs> Begin to think that way. Meditate that way. Daydream that way. See yourself that way. Seeing, he said, that God has granted us everything. Amen? In verse 10, he says, Christ is in you. Now, if Christ is in us, it means we've been perfected into his likeness and also into his character. That's what it means. 
In fact, let me show you a prayer that Jesus prayed, meaning that Christ is in us. Go to John 17 for a moment, please. John 17. And look at what it says. John 17. This is a prayer that Jesus prayed. Verse 21. That they all may be one. Even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. Folks, that prayer is talking about being in his character, his likeness, his nature, his fullness. Verse 23. I in them. Is Christ dwelling in us? Amen. Let me ask again. Is Christ dwelling in us? If Christ is dwelling in us, has he promised to make us alive? Praise the Lord. I in them, thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity. Is that in your Bible? That means if his character, his likeness, his nature, his fullness. Same substance, same stuff. Amen? In Galatians 2, look what it says there. Let me show it to you this way. Galatians 2, verse 20. Paul says in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. Have you been crucified with Christ? Amen. Amen. And it is no longer I who live. I wonder how many of y'all believe that. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. That means I'm living totally by the faith of what God's doing in me. You catch what he's saying to us? And I am not nullifying the grace of God. That means I'm living totally by the grace of God. And of course, he had that same problem with the church of Galatians and he had, Galatia they had in Rome. In Rome. Let's go to Ephesians 3. Here Paul writes again in the 14th verse. He said, for this reason, verse 14, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its, what's that word? Name, and name means what? Nature. Nature. Like this. Same image. That he will grant to you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through what? Faith. And that you being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. Yeah. Because the love of Christ controls us. Amen. Look what he says in the uh, 11th verse. He says, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He talks about something that was an eternal purpose that's not going to be carried out, but something that had already been carried out. 
Um, what was that eternal purpose, you think? Salvation. Really good answer. Any other answers? Mm -hmm. Cross. Interesting answer. Well, let me say this to you. Um, Paul was always hinting about it. Always hinting about it. In fact, in verse 3, he said, I wrote before about this mystery. It's very simple. It's Christ Jesus in us. And folks, listen carefully. That's the only hope of glory we have. Without Christ Jesus being in us, there is no hope of any glory ever. It's Christ Jesus in us that gives us the hope that we will be perfected into the same character, the same nature, and the same mind of Christ as he is. It is called salvation. Amen? In Romans 8, let's at least see if we can get most of this through today. He says in the 11th verse, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit. Oh, how does life come to our mortal bodies? It comes, huh? It's a work of the Spirit. Those times when you're saying, oh, praise you, Lord, it's so wonderful, and the presence of God is going through you. It's a work of His Spirit. He says, who indwells you. How do you know that His Spirit is indwelling you? Go to John 7, you know this one. Jesus says in verse 38 and 39, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And, he says, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his inmost being, or innermost being, it comes from the deepest part of the real you. Shall flow rivers. That's the giving of life to give all the body of living water. Amen. In Romans 6, Paul says to us in the fourth verse, Romans 6, verse 4. Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Why? Class? Why is it we can walk in newness of life? Because of what? Blood. The blood. What else? Huh? I'm straining to hear you guys. What y'all saying? <laughs> Say it again. It because it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. And just like he was raised by the glory of God, the hope of glory is within us, and that glory is what's giving life to our mortal bodies. Grace, glory. The springs of life is God's glory. Amen? Now, since you're in that sixth chapter, let's remind ourselves of this. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old self was, 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 was crucified with him, 
that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. No longer, no longer, no longer, no longer, no longer. No longer, no longer. Why? Because he's indwelling us. Is that right? In um, John 5, 21. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life. Even so, the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. Who does he give life to? He gives life in those he's indwelling. Is that clear? (laughs) Well, let's go back to Romans 8. So then, brethren, he says, this is the 12th chapter verse, we are under obligation. Oh, but it's not to the flesh. Why did he say that? Because that's what natural man thinks about. He thinks about prosperity. He thinks about what he's going to eat. He thinks about what he's going to drink. He thinks about what job. These are all obligations of the flesh. And yes, we need to have these needs met. So Paul says, now brethren, therefore brethren, we are under obligation. Not to the flesh, live according to the flesh, or anything about the things of the flesh. He said, for if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. Now, that is such a horrible, pitiful translation. Brother, what does it say the King James Bible there in verse 13, uh, early? It says, but if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Okay, that's almost accurate. What it should say is, you are about to die spiritually. If all you're living and thinking about is this world and your needs and the flesh, you are about to die spiritually. Did you catch that? But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the flesh, oh, that I could almost end the, the, the course without them. We could shut the doors and say, Bible school's dismissed until a few weeks go by. That sums up everything. Amen. How do we put to death the deeds of the flesh? By the Spirit, not by our might. It's not by power, it's not by might, it's by my Spirit, says the Lord. He said you put it to death by the Spirit, the deeds of the body. Is that right? Then he says, you'll live. And how do you put to death by the deeds of the Spirit? That's the beginning. You go to God, Lord, give me the grace to do it, give me the power to do it. And that's when you can say the love of God is being shed in my heart by the Holy Spirit because it's the love of God that gives us control, isn't it? Amen. It's done by the Spirit, isn't it? So our obligation, in other words, is to die to all flesh they live in. And uh, I got about a minute and I wanted to get that in. Right now there's a footnote, Ephesians 4, verse 17 to 32. In Colossians 3, verse 5 through 17. Our obligation is to die to all fleshly living. Ephesians 4, verse 17 to 32. And Colossians 3, verses 5 through 17. Our obligation is to die to all fleshly living. Ephesians 4, verse 17 to 32. Colossians 3, verses 5 through 17. And now we begin to see what the sons of God are. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God. And I'm going to remind you again, whenever you see that, it simply means you're putting to death the deeds of the flesh and of the body by the Spirit. It doesn't mean you're turning cartwheels or 
chasing people down and saying, Lord, the Lord, let me do this. It doesn't mean at all. It means you're being led by the Spirit to put to death all the deeds of the flesh and of the body. And that's why you see the obligation in Ephesians 4, 17 to 32. God says, you do that. You do that. And I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. You cannot do it unless the Spirit of God does it. That's the only way it's done. Yet God keeps saying, you put this off, you put that off. You cannot do it unless God does it. And your job is to keep going to God and read it. Is that right? Amen. And of course, we pick up verse 15 next time. And you might want to write this down to, to uh, Romans 8, 14. Write down John 8, 34 through 36. And Galatians 4, 1 through 9. John 8, 34 through 36. And Galatians 4, 1 through 9. John 8, 34 through 36. And Galatians 4, 1 through 9. That goes with, if you're living according to this flesh, you are about to die spiritually. But if by the Spirit you put in death, these the body you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Let me, let me ask you something. How many believers do you know that speak in tongues, prophesy, gifts, and everything, who are not putting to death these in the flesh and don't know that something as simple as anger can cause them to lose their inheritance? Now, you understand why the way is so narrow and few that be that find it? Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you for this session. Lord, we don't just want to have knowledge, but Lord, we learn to pray wisely. Give us the spirit to do what we are not able to do. Lord, to overcome the deeds of our flesh, to overcome the deeds of our body, to walk in the character and the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us. We are helpless. And our dependency is totally, completely, and wholeheartedly upon you. We bring our steps to you and remind us to meditate continually in those times of the fire from, the, from this world and the enemy. We thank you in Jesus' name. Well, can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah.